I'm honored to welcome Teresita Fernandez this evening as part of our Golding Visiting Artists and Scholars series, and also in conjunction with our exhibition at the Contemporary Art Museum, which is called Blind Landscape. This is Teresita Fernandez's exhibition. And if you haven't made your way over to the museum yet to see this terrific show, I strongly suggest you do. And before I invite Teresita up, I want to tell you a few things about her. Teresita is known for her immersive installations and evocative large-scale sculptures. Her work has been presented by institutions around the world, including the New Museum in New York, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Institute for Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, uh, Site Santa Fe, Castello di Rivoli in Torino, Italy, and the Wit de Wit in Rotterdam. Teresita is the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, both in the US and abroad, including the 2005 MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, as well as the 2003 Guggenheim Fellowship. Over the last several years, Teresita has been working increasingly on large-scale public commissions, both indoor and outdoor. Among them are commissions at the Seattle Art Museum's Olympic Sculpture Park, where her work, Seattle Cloud Cover, allows visitors to walk through a covered skyway while viewing the city's skyline through tiny holes in multicolored glass. In January of this year, the Blanton Museum of Art, where this exhibition here at the CAM will travel in November, unveiled Stacked Waters, which is a site-specific commission, a permanent commission, created for a cavernous entrance of the museum. In addition, Teresita has just completed Starfield, uh, which is a permanent installation at the new Dallas Cowboys Stadium in Texas. Um, and if that wasn't enough, Teresita just returned from Japan where her new site-specific commission, Blind Blue Landscape, at the renowned Benese Art Site in Naoshima, Japan, which I look forward to her speaking about this evening, just opened. And uh, I'm also proud to say that Teresita will begin working this fall on another large-scale site-specific commission, this one here on the USF campus at the College of Nursing. So please help me welcome Teresita Fernandez. Hi, Satula. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Um, before I start, I just want to thank uh, David Knorr and Margaret Miller um, of Graphic Studio and Cam and all the other subgroups of <laughs> all the things here. Um, I've been working with David over the past three years on, on different artworks, which we'll see, and it's sort of culminated in the exhibition here, and it's been a real pleasure um, to work with such a professional group of people, and I'm really thrilled to be um, a part of the programs here. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and start. I'm gonna show you work from about, I have to do the math now, because I feel like every time I do a lecture, I have like three pieces that I've added onto the lecture, so it keeps getting longer and longer, and I'm gonna try to be as brief as possible tonight. Um, uh, the oldest work I'll show you is this one, which is from 1996, and then most of the works I'll show you are from the last about three or four years, uh, or maybe about five years. Um, so this is a piece from 1996. It's an untitled piece. Um, a lot of what I'll show you today, in addition to images of the works, are I want to just give you a little, I think what's interesting about lectures is to give you a little bit of an insight as to how it is that I work and how I develop ideas. My work is conceptual, so I develop ideas first. I do a lot of research and development. Sometimes that takes years. And then, you know, it sort of slowly meanders and ends up manifesting in a finished work of art. So in the lecture, I will have a lot of reference images and sort of peeks at the different things that I'm piecing together and thinking about, which are not necessarily part of the finished product or part of a narrative, but they're an inherent part of my process. And so I put them in the lecture just to make the lecture a little bit more interesting. Um, so this piece from 1996 is, uh, it's partially based on a design by the um, modernist architect Ada Blos, who designed this 1928, this house for Josephine Baker in 1928 in Paris. It was never built, but it exists in the form of uh, drawings and models. And to, to quickly describe the, the sort of idea of the layout of the house is there's an indoor swimming pool on the second level of the house. Above that are skylights. And below on the first floor are these narrow hallways that encircle basically the, the, the area of water in the pool. Um, I was really interested in 
in how this, this space was designed. Um, and in some of my earlier works, I, I was very interested in this kind of voyeuristic sensibility. I mean, in fact, what Adolf Loos did is put Josephine Baker on display within her own house. So um, if you were walking around these narrow hallways on the first floor, you were basically in this very darkened area. The, the skylights above the pool would make the other side of those windows, the ones in the pool, appear to be like mirrors. So if you were Josephine Baker swimming in the pool, you would see your own reflection. If you were walking around the dark hallways, you would see basically be like looking into a fishbowl. You would be in the darkened area looking in. So the whole premise of the house was basically this idea of a narcissistic gaze superimposed on the voyeuristic gaze. And, and in, in, in this case, the architect was the voyeur who's kind of looking at this, this very fetishized, exoticized body of this woman moving through the water in her own home. So I, I, some of my early works deal a lot with this idea of looking and being looked at. Um, the piece I made, this is the way that you enter the space, and there's a long hallway. At the end of it, you go up a series of steps, um, and you are, <clears throat> I might need a little bit of water, because my voice is sort of cracking. Um, you're on the high end of this ramped floor. This space is about 20 by 40 feet. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, the walls and the, the floor is painted this blue color and it slowly fades up the walls. So uh, at the top, it's sort of almost white and there's a little bit of a drawing up there too, which you may or may not see, it's extremely subtle. Um, and so if you are on the outs, these windows are tinted. So if you're on this side of it, you look in. And if you're on this side, you basically see your own reflection. So each of these windows, and there are four of them, um, regardless of whether or not someone's standing on the other side of it, each window represents the potential to be seen. In my piece, of course, there's this sort of uh, merging of subject and object, or the person looking and the person being looked at, because in fact, in order to get to this spot, you have to have come through that darkened hallway. So you inherently know that if you're absorbed in your own image looking at this mirror, you know that someone might be looking at you. In fact, probably is looking at you. Um, um, this, is, this is actually my first solo show in New York um, that I made shortly afterwards. And it, it also sort of refers to this idea of, of an empty swimming pool image-wise, formally. It's, it's very similar in, in in the way it looks, but conceptually it's actually the, the inverse. Um, this is at Deitch Projects in New York, and um, if, if you look in this image, a lot of times my work is uh, compared to architecture or it's described as being architectural. I actually don't know a thing about architecture. I mean, I'm interested in ideas and I call from everywhere you can think of. Um, and in this piece, I always like to point out that there's about, this whole piece was actually built in Miami and sent to New York and it was assembled in the space, and there's about <clears throat> an inch of space between the wall and, of the gallery and the piece itself. So I, I like to think of it as a very big sculpture, or like this idea of a hand and a glove, where there's this little bit of space and where the piece, in fact, isn't directly dependent on the structure of the architecture. Um, if you go up these steps, the color's off, by the way. Um, you can see that there's there's some drawing in there, I don't know if you can see it, it's very subtle, of these little geometric um, squares, which look a little bit like tiles. And what's happening with the color is, it's all paint. So it looks like the lights are doing it, but it's in fact sprayed paint. So at the bottom it's sprayed, if you look, what you see in the middle, the darkened area, is the, the floor of the real gallery. So what I did is, I raised the floor of the gallery about five and a half feet. Um, and you never enter that space, you just kind of look into this big hole. Um, so conceptually, it's sort of the inverse of the other one in that it, it, was, it almost became like this sort of stage or this sort of runway where you were uh, completely um, uh, able to scope the whole entire space at once. Um, this is a piece called Borrowed Landscape, and it consists of these five volumes that are made with fabric and the floors are made out of detailed drawings uh, and the top has, the to each top has um, a source of light in it. Um, 
I, I think of, I thought of, the, of these pieces at the time as being sort of like uh, an indoor landscape or an outdoor room. And at the time, I was really interested in 17th century formal gardens um, and in this idea of sort of merging the decorative interior and the landscape, or the decorative interior and the decorative landscape. Um, so I was looking at um, your typical sort of 17th century formal gardens like Volet Vicomte or Versailles, which is maybe not the best example, but the best known example. Um, and those gardens are always represented in drawings like this, where there's a kind of bird's eye view. Um, if you go to these places, you know, there's no way that you would ever see this layout. The only way that you understand the geometry of this layout is by, is by walking through the garden and by sort of tracing it um, with your moving body. So I was very curious about these, these sort of vantage points that develop. In real life, if you were walking through this space, you basically have all of these compressed vistas that, of pictorial space which uh, shift as you move um, from the chateau down into the garden. And so something that might be very far might appear to be very flattened out. And there's this whole sort of three-dimensional um, sense of, of, of depth and of foreshortening that happens when you're actually exploring these spaces that's completely lost in the representation of gardens, at, like what you see here, which is a flat garden, so which is a flat drawing. So um, the, the drawings are taken from images like that. Um, the floor has this very detailed and very small uh, area of pattern of drawing that is taken from those shaped parterre hedges from different European gardens, and um, like that. And uh, they also are meant to refer to a kind of um, decorative rug or an interior. So again, playing with this idea of scale, I'm drawing something that in fact is vast, a vast landscape, but I'm referring to something that might be a, a two inch by two inch decorative pattern in a weaving. And at the time, this was actually right after I had come back from my first trip to Japan where I, I lived for a little while and I was, I was also really interested in traditional Japanese garden design. Um, so uh, simultaneously to, to being interested in, 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 the formal, in the European formal gardens. So some, some of the traditional Japanese garden techniques like, um, like, like this, which is called shakei, actually the title of the piece, Borrowed Landscape, is a sort of bad English translation of shakei, which is, sh shakei is more like saying to capture alive so the technique is really to capture alive. We call it borrowed landscape. Um, and what happens in shakei is that a vista is framed. And in the, in the traditional Japanese, in traditional Japanese architecture, there's this very fine line between the interior and the landscape. And it's all about, Jap the traditional Japanese interior is very dark. And then you have these openings in the walls, basically. So a whole entire wall will be missing or, I mean, it's actually just a totally different sensibility of what a wall even is. Um, and then things within that image will be cropped and manipulated to appear almost like, almost like a diorama, but, but of course it's a real landscape. And so a shrub in the foreground, Mount Fuji in the background, something in the middle ground, these, all of these elements of pictorial space in the foreground, middle ground, background are kind of compressed. And it almost looks like a film that's being projected. Um, and throughout my lecture tonight, I'll make a lot of reference, references to cinema and to a kind of very cinematic way of, of seeing and thinking about images that, that sort of is a, thre a thread that runs through the work. These are just drawings from around the same time. This is a piece called Landscape Projected, also from the same period. And, um, well, I shouldn't say from the same period. That makes me sound really old, right? <laughs> um, okay, so this is about the same time, maybe a, couple, a year later or something, later that year. Uh, this is called Landscape Projected. And again, I'm thinking about the same sorts of things. Um, this room is built for the piece. The piece is the room. This is not an existing gallery space. Um, the floor is painted this very, very intense neon green color, and it slowly fades 
of the walls. So about halfway up the wall, if you look from there up, the space is actually white. What happens is the color on the floor bounces off of the white ceiling and the top of the walls, and it makes it look like it has this color green glow. Um, but it's actually just color bouncing off of the white surface. And if you go to the museum, you'll see that in one of the pieces, it's in the museum, same, basically the same technique. Um, at the top is an opening, kind of an oculus, and um, there is a light in there with, um, with, with, it's an artificial light that basically simulates daylight. Um, and the, the pattern on the floor is again a reference to a, a parterre or formal geometric garden pattern. Um, the other element that you're not seeing here, and I don't have a video of this piece, is that there's a sound, and you kind of don't know where it's coming from. It's a sound of a sprinkler, a lawn sprinkler, your average, you know, Florida, I grew up in Miami, uh, lawn sprinkler sound, and it's, it's recorded from a sprinkler that's moving in a circular pattern. So it kind of goes like, and then it backs up. If you live here, you're very familiar with that sound. When I give this lecture in the north, people have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, and the idea of the piece is that what I was, my intention was that the whole space would almost be like an image that was being projected into the space from this oculus, almost as though I was making a projection room. And so, the, so that you have the projection of sound is circular and the projection of light is circular. And the reason why I picked those, those specific references is that the sound of the sprinkler and in refer, and referring also to the garden and the sprinkler and the garden, was almost, that sound was almost identical to the sound of a film projector running. So it's almost like this whole image was being made or manufactured or sort of pumped out of this oculus. This is not my work. This is the cave of Tiberius, which is dated first century AD, and it's in, in Sperlonga. Um, at the time, I was doing uh, a residency at the American Academy in Rome, and um, I was very interested in ancient sites, and especially sort of optical illusions within ancient sites, and um, doing a lot of research with underground spaces like cisterns and um, nymphaeums and all kinds of sort of interesting uh, ancient sites. Um, so this is just south of Rome and I was fascinated by this space. This is just, I mean it's there, anybody could go there. And um, originally it was like a triclinium. So people would, you know, hang out here and have a banquet and fish would be taken out of this area in the front and cooked and eaten and enjoyed. Um, right now, of course, it's ruins, so um, it looks like this. And it's actually really fascinating because the whole space becomes uh, a mirror image of itself and everything is, is doubled. Um, and again, throughout my work, you'll see this, this doubling, this reflection and this, this use as a kind of a mirror in order to make a kind of portrait of the very thing that you're looking at. So um, when I was looking at this, I was planning this show, which was at Berkeley. And um, it was a really ugly space. So what I did was I, 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 I basically used the entire budget to change the space as much as I can. And what I had them do was take the floor and make it as high polished as possible. So the whole floor was like uh, refinished and polished and coated, and so, in, in fact, you know, the piece that I made was more about changing the space in order to make it do what I wanted it to do. And then I, I made these series of circular sculptures that have many layers of mirror, uh, scrims, printed patterns, I mean, you name it. Some of these have like eight or 10 layers. It's impossible to sort of tell when you look at them how deep they really are. And what I was thinking about was this sort of um, and you could look inside of them. Um, what I was thinking of was this, this, this space underneath the plane that the viewer stands on. And so you're standing on this space, but really the whole piece is implying this, this doubled underneath you, this like doubled kind of underground, ghost-like double of the place that you're standing in. 
Um, in the, on the right is a piece called Waterfall, and on the, on the left is a piece called 3.37 p.m. Um, this was the first piece that I made using small elements on the wall, and I had struggled with it for a long time because I wanted to, you know, I kind of thought, like, the idea of a rainbow is like just about, like, the cheesiest thing that you could think of, so I struggled with it for a long time because there, were, there was a sort of cliche associated with, like, the iconography of how rainbows are represented, but I was really interested in the, the kind of atmospheric gradation of what happens in uh, a a what we'd call a rainbow. So this piece is made of, I think this one has, this is big, this is like about, it's like maybe 28 feet long, and it's made of, I don't know, maybe over 30,000 of these little cubes that I made. Um, and there's the, the work in the show here, you'll see are, are related to this, but this was the first piece that I made like that. So it looks like there's just red and orange and yellow, but there are actually like five or six reds, six or seven different kinds of orange, you know, lots of different kinds of yellow. So the gradation happens very, very slowly, and there are lots of changes happening point by point. Um, and what happens is, what happens is that when your eye is bombarded, when your eyes are bombarded with so much stimuli, like just so many different points, it's impossible to select just one. And so what happens is that you're constantly shifting between each individual point, and it creates this kind of like buzzing, this kind of like peripheral uh, uh, dynamic sort of effect. Um, anytime, that, and I'll talk about this in other pieces, anytime that you see even like an impressionist painting, it's made out of all of these tiny little points, and what what lends it, it, it that kind of movement and that kind of dynamic sort of like dazzling quality is the fact that you can't select one little point. Um, and that's in effect what I was doing here. And in a way what I did is reduce the idea of a rainbow to its most bas basic element, which is just individual drops of water that are refracting light. So it's almost like each one of these, including the shadow and the, the, the reflections that were caused around it by the light, by the light on it um, was almost like one individual event in, in that thing, bigger thing that we would refer to as a, I actually don't even use the word rainbow, it's called 3.37 p.m., but of course the obvious, it's an obvious reference. Um, so this is Waterfall. Um, and interesting because I've, I've, there's a waterfall piece in the show here um, that I've kind of returned to to this idea of the water, this image of the waterfall, which kind of never went away. There's, there are lots of references to water in my work and, and to just natural phenomenon and things in the landscape. And I've always been really interested in, in, in how sites in the landscape are not only exoticized, but selected or, or made important, um, and the area around those things. So there's this sort of notion that nature happens or landscape happens in front of your eyes, you know, like, you know, it's, it's this very sort of empirical way of thinking about things like, you know, views, postcards, vistas all happen from you looking out. And of course, it's a, it's a ridiculous notion because nature doesn't exist in front of your eyes. It, you know, it's above and behind you and all around you and, and you're implied in it. So I'm always very interested in this idea that as a viewer, you're not separate from the landscape. You're, you in fact are very much implied and there's this sensibility that I, I'm trying to sort of anthropomorphize the landscape so that in fact, the landscape is looking back at you, you know, and there's a kind of reciprocity there that isn't based on, um, for example, if you think of those uh, formal gardens that I showed you, they were all designed, all these converging lines were designed to meet at the back of the chateau, which is where the king would stand. And so it's like all lines would kind of emanate from the viewer. So it's a very, it's a very Western idea. It's a very European idea, um, and it of course always privileges the viewer. But it's it's a very, um, it, it's a very narrow way of looking at nature and landscape and one's surroundings. This is the back side of it. Um, the piece on the right is called Dune.
and it's it's made it's a big piece it's made out of aluminum and that's been covered with many many tiny very tiny little glass beads and i actually you know looked at a lot of sand dunes when i made this piece um, i used the glass because of course the glass is made from sand so it was this way of referring back to to glass and to sand sorry um, this is the, the way, the entrance into a piece called precipice. And this is what it looks like from the other side. The color's off, it's actually closer to this. Um, and you can't see it in this slide, but pres this piece is actually partially based on, uh, on, um, sorry, on Michelangelo's uh, Laurentian Library. In Florence, and uh, if you if you look at this space, when you get to the top of these steps, the only thing you see is that one line, which is why it's called precipice. You don't see the stairs going down, so you're really on the high end of this uh, vantage point or this viewpoint where you can sort of survey the the gallery, the landscape of the gallery. And a piece like this too, you'll see like the details. The color of the, of the structure is sprayed on the wall and slowly fades to white. So this massive thing, in fact, is very, almost dissolves. Um, this is a, a temporary site-specific piece that I did um, at uh, Villa Medici in, in Rome. And this is inside of the ancient Roman cistern. It was a big show that dealt with the garden. Um, most people did things outside, and I fell in love with this particular particular site, which was the old cistern. The only thing is that I couldn't really touch anything because, of course, it was like this historical site. I couldn't touch the walls. I couldn't really place anything in there, and so I did this very kind of simple intervention, which is I had uh, I had somebody who specializes in model making um, making trees for very high end architectural models make these cypress, make many hundreds of these cypress trees. They're all handmade and they're all made with natural materials. So each one's different. Each one's a very different kind of green. Each one has like its own sort of personality. And I kind of planted them into, um, weight, with weights into, into the cistern. So you walk in and this is what you see. And it was kind of amazing because essentially what it did is it turned the whole cistern and all of the marks of the mineral deposits on the wall into this big alpine landscape. And it turned, um, all of those marks, all of those ancient marks of the Pompeian red that was used to seal the cistern originally, um, all of a sudden looked like peaks and mountains and winding roads. Uh, this is at MoMA in New York, and um, it's a piece called Hot House. Uh, again, you can see that this is a, a precursor to one of the pieces in the show um, here. Um, this is during their first phase of renovation. Um, and the first thing to go was the garden outside. I'm sorry, I'm just checking time. The first thing to go was the garden outside. And they asked me to do something on this, on this wall of glass. And what I did is this kind of meandering vine pattern made out of precision cut plastic. Um, and the windows were covered with a slightly reflective um, film. And so the back of this white pattern is actually very bright green, and that green reflects into um, the surface of, of that film. Um, so if you were to measure where the green is reflected, it would actually be outside of the, of the space. It would be on the other side of the glass. So it was, it was this way of sort of inserting the garden back into the outside of the museum. Um, this is a piece called Bamboo Cinema that I did in 2001 in Madison Square Park in New York. And it's very reminiscent of early cinematic devices. It's made at, with all of these um, poles that I had made for me. Um, and they're in concentric patterns, so it's almost like a, like a maze that you can walk around. Uh, and when you're walking through it, or when we would be still and someone else was walking through it, um, it, it appears like everything is very sort of like moving in this very uh, 
well, it depends what speed you're moving, but it can look very like, a, like an old film. It looks like it's sort of off time-wise or that it's going too fast or too slow. And again, what, it, what I was essentially trying to do with this piece is manipulate that sensibility of how it is that your eyes work and the fact that you know, when you have all of these different bits of information, in this case, each of these verticals, um, the way you see is is altered and affected. So just to back up a little bit, because some people may not may not know this, but if you think of a film when you go to the movie theater, uh, the way that the way that a film appears to be moving works like this. It's called persistence of vision, and you basically you know that a film is made of a series of frames, right? So basically, you have a frame. The frame is. I'm giving you the simple simple version. You have a frame, the frame is projected, um, and then the shutter closes, and the next frame is projected. Shutter closes. This is the sound of the projector that you hear. When that shutter closes, you have this you know, microsecond, um, and there's actually an exact amount, but I can't recall it. You have a microsecond where there is no image being projected. But what happens is the first image is is reflected on the back of your retina, and it, when the shutter closes and the image disappears, it stays there as a kind of ghost image that, that remains on your retina, and then the next image appears. This is why when you see a film, it appears to be moving, because in effect, these series of uh, frames are being connected, not by the projector, but by it is that your, how it is that your eyes work, and how it is that you retain this sort of ghost image that then connects to the next image that's being projected. So in this piece, sorry, in this piece, each one of these verticals is almost like that shutter. If you're standing, uh, if you were standing here, and a cab drives by Madison Avenue, which is back there, yellow cab, that yellow cab would kind of enter the piece and go this big blob of yellow kind of moving through the piece. If you're standing still and you see somebody running, they, they kind of appear in and out of, of motion. And then, um, oh, and so what, one of the things I was thinking about is the idea that the viewer, in fact, would be like a performer, but also like a spectator, and sort of looking at where the two merge and, and, and overlap. It's something that you'll see in, in other works as well. Um, like this piece. This is called Fire, and it, conceptually, it's the same exact thing as Bamboo Cinema. It works exactly the same way. Um, I did this with the Fabric Workshop and Museum in, in Philadelphia, and in this case, the whole thing floats. You can see these two big rings, and there's, it, it's all suspended, um, so there's space underneath this bottom ring, and each little vertical, in this case, is a piece of very, very fine um, dyed silk. And when you move around, I was sort of interested in trying to capture, not, not to illustrate fire, but to capture the kind of behavior of fire. So when you're standing here and you're moving around, the whole thing kind of appears to be this sort of shifting, dancing um, coloration that's it's, it's very hard to sort of pinpoint. And I happen, oops, I happen to have really good images of the process of this piece, which I like to show because oftentimes people don't realize the amount of uh, trial and error, but also just work that goes into making something when you see it in a museum. Um, I had done some early models for this piece and they were very unsuccessful. I basically wanted to make something that really wasn't physical, it wasn't um, tangible, and any, anything that I tried to put in there to hold this thing together looked like just a big piece of plastic or something. So I was trying to, to, to make something that was very elusive, but I really had to find a way to transcend the materials to make them do what I wanted them to do. And it wasn't until I visited um, this place called Scalamandre, um, which is an old textile um, very old, very highly regarded textile uh, place that used to be in Long Island City, Queens, um, 
uh, they recreate a lot of historical textiles and, and such. And I walked into this factory full of all of these mechanical looms. So you can imagine all of these things moving. And I realized that that's exactly what it is that I was trying to do. In this case, it was even more beautiful because they were moving and a lot of the threads, the silk threads here, were made with were gold or silver and so it was just reflecting the light in a very beautiful way. This is silk being dyed and I ended up actually buying bulk silk from them. But um, this is silk being dyed. Um, and the piece was, is finished at the top and the bottom, which you can't see because it's covered up with the metal, but it's finished at the top and the bottom by a weaver who created like a kind of finish on it so it wouldn't unravel. And all of that is hidden underneath this metal part, uh, this metal ring at the top and the bottom. So you don't see the finish, you just see the little threads coming out. Um, there was a lot of time spent on trying, at any given point you're looking through four layers of silk. So there's one layer of silk on each part of that ring. So here's one part of the ring, one, two, and then the other part. So wherever you stand around that circle, you're looking through four layers. Um, and there was a lot of testing basically to see what the distance had to be in order to, to maximize that effect. So if it was too close, it looked like nothing. If it was too far away, those layers, you basically didn't see anything either. Um, but when you got it just right, you had this sort of dissolving, uh, very beautiful optical effect. Um, these are, this is all silk dye. Um, it was like 10 colors, and the whole thing is made from these 10 colors which were mixed specifically for the piece. If you look on the left, you'll see a little drawing, which is my template, my little diagram showing how I wanted those, those flames to, to look. Um, and that drawing was basically a ring that was just opened up. So that little drawing was turned into real size templates. And it was done section by section with these templates that would be lined up and sprayed. Now the thing about silk is when you dye silk, it's not like painting something. You actually change the molecular structure of the silk when you dye it. So when you're done dyeing it, the color is actually goes all the way through. It's actually part of the silk. It's not like color sitting on something. But when you're, when you're working on it, you have to use a lot more dye than what will eventually stay on the, the, the silk. So it's like working blindly, like you don't know really what that color is going, you almost have to compensate for the fact that if you, you know, maybe 60% of the material that you apply, that you spray, will be washed out. So it's a little bit like working blindly. And I worked with some really amazing technicians who helped me on this. So the whole thing was built up with color and by the end of the spraying, it looked like a bad sort of 1970s murder film. Um, and then each of those panels is, was individually washed three times and then steamed for three hours, which is what makes the, the dye actually uh, become integral to, to the silk itself. Uh, this is a piece that's in the show here. It's called Ink Mirror and um, it's from 2007. And I had become fascinated with this little device, which is um, an early 19th century tool used by painters who wanted to paint like the great landscape painter Claude uh, uh, Lorraine. So it's essentially a little black curved piece of glass. Um, sometimes it was made out of obsidian. There are still a few in the world that you can see in museum exhibitions. Um, and it was, it was a kind of visual tool. So if you know the work of Claude Lorraine, you know that he was painting these very sort of idealistic moody landscapes. And what this tool would do is that it wasn't a true reflection. What it reflects is just the highest highlights and the deepest shadows. So if you were a painter, it would help you to just sort of, you know, it's like a photo, like how you would use a Photoshop function now to just see the highlights or the, the, the deepest colors 
and high contrast of an image. That's essentially what it is. And the way it worked is you would go to your site, whatever it is that you wanted to paint, and you would hold this little curved piece of glass um, with your back to the scene that you were painting, and it would be reflected here. And I was completely just sort of taken by this idea that you would turn your back to the landscape in order to see it. So whenever you see a title for a piece of mine or the, the title of the show called Blind Landscape, it's often a reference to, to, to that, to the idea that when you turn your, land to your back to something in order to see it, what you're in fact doing is seeing it in a very different way. And this is precisely what my work's about. It's about the, the sort of very artificial construction that, it, that happens um, in our mind's eye, which is about um, you really fabricate a scene. You really understand something and you understand the world around you, not by what's really there, but, but, but how it is that you subjectively, subjectively inform that image and, and shape it based on your individual sort of connection with it. Um, and this, this little tool was also used by kind of pilgrims who would travel around, like tourists basically, who would travel around England and want to like see some little monastery or something that they had traveled to see. And they would, they would literally turn and look at it in just as its reflection. So there's always been this sort of uh, human nature has always, you know, we've always been sort of fascinated by this idea of capturing a landscape or um, almost making these, these postcard size portable uh, views of the landscape. And so that's, that's what this piece is about. Um, Hoping this will start. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do is to sort of insert the viewer into the snowy landscape. This is made out of high polished fiberglass and the bottom is covered with uh, marble dust so it's sort of sparkly. And if the whole snowy part of the landscape is reflected or doubled in, in the reflection of, of the glass, so when you, of the, the black fiberglass. So when you stand in front of it, your image also appears to be in that snowy area. And, um, and then the piece also became like a big real-time film developing in front of your eyes. And I'm really, this is it in my studio, um, but I'm especially happy with how it's installed here at the museum because um, when I showed it in New York, it was in the gallery space and there wasn't a whole lot of activity around it. It was sort of a more sterile space. Um, but the fact that it's right in front of the doors, if you stand there and you just spend like a few minutes, not only do you see yourself, but you see all of this activity of people walking behind you and doors opening. And it's almost like a film that's being projected and developing in front of your in front of your eyes as, as you're there. So it becomes just a portrait of, of the space itself. Um, this piece is also in the show. It's called Longing Double Portrait. Um, the piece on the, the what's well, one piece, but this part on the left is made out of high polished black onyx. Um, the the right hand side is made out of uh, convex pieces of mirrored glass, so they reflect you and everything in it upside down and reversed. And I'll, I'll just speak about it briefly, but um, I, I've been very fascinated by this idea of portraiture, not in a traditional way, although throughout art history we see many, um, many references to, to mirrors as indirect portraits. So you have a portrait of something or an event and then you have these little bits of mirrors that are always hidden within, um, within an image that are really reflecting the sort of more real scene or the more significant scene. And you can see the whole, well, I don't know how much you can see, but you can see the, the gallery space reflected in there. It's almost like each one of these becomes like a little world that's being encompassed. This is Vertigo, um, which is also in the show and was fabricated here at Graphic Studio. And um, I, I wanted to make a piece, it's, it's, 
the image obviously refers to a kind of canopy sort of tree pattern, but I was really thinking of Baroque ceiling paintings. And I was, I was thinking of the viewer being in this position where they had to look up in order to see something. And so when you look up, you are basically seeing yourself inverted um, in the space above you, but also taking on the pattern, this kind of organic pattern of foliage. Okay, I'm just gonna move a little bit quicker here so I can finish. I don't wanna drag on too long. It's slow after the work. Okay, this is the piece that I did in um, Seattle at the Olympic Sculpture Park. La it was completed last year. And it's the length of a city block, of New York City block. And it's made out of glass um, that's been, uh, there, there are all these little clear holes within it. Um, the image is made from, it's a kind of a montage of many thousands of images that were shot in South Florida. Um, which they love to point out in Seattle because Seattle does not have good clouds, but it's, it's not sunny, but I, I, I went to Miami basically and shot like clouds for three days um, and I, I made this. Um, and what I like to do with this piece is just kind of talk, I just did a, a lecture at Williams and um, I put in a lot of reference material because when I was doing this piece, um, I, I was thinking about all of these references that for a long time I didn't even tell anybody about. And then when the piece was done, I was like, totally, like it totally made sense that I was thinking about all of those things. Um, so I was thinking about things like Jericho's Rap of the Medusa, romantic French uh, painting, uh, Hokusai prints, and there's a definite uh, reference to Japanese prints in, in this piece. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, there are parts of it that just completely dissolve. It changes a lot based on the lighting. And I'm gonna show you a lot of images of what it does at different times of the day. And you know, I mean, depending on the angle of the light, the time of the year, the piece does entirely different, different things. They loved seeing this in Japan. Of course, what I'm looking at is the background of anime, uh, which the background of, of the anime is just like French romantic paintings. It's like the same exact thing. Um, and so what starts happening is like the light, depending on the time of the day, just bounces off of everything. This is the, the concrete wall that holds you know, something 40 feet away, and the color starts getting on it. The bottom becomes, the, the gravel becomes colored. It also gets on your own body and on your clothes, so you become colored as well. Um, and the piece changes as it goes along, so there's a big section of like pink, and then orange, and then blue. Um, sometimes it's very intense, and sometimes it's very, very watercolory. So what happens is you start to see downtown Seattle um, through these little openings. Now you're walking, so it's almost like a, like a panorama. You know, you're walking and back to that reference, that cinematic reference and that interruption of, of looking, of viewing. Um, each of these little views is a view of downtown Seattle, but then it's, it switches because you have this area of color and then there's another one and another one and lots and lots of them. So it's like the images flicker in and out and, and have this sort of flickering quality because of it. And so this is, for example, early morning. You, there are times where you see almost no color or like you'll see a little bit of blue and then it just looks like clear glass. And then as the angle of the sun changes, you'll see different things. Or you'll see if there happens to be a day like this where there's a big cloud or a particular kind of sunset, that is reflected onto the glass too. So all of these different images become almost sandwiched together. And again, you know, kind of goes back to 
that whole idea of the Japanese garden where you have these things in the distances and things very close to you compress. So it seems like there, there are these different scales happening simultaneously. Yes, it's about this view and uh, downtown Seattle and capturing that and all that, but it's also just about the size of your eye and the, the, your, the size of your eye in relation to that whole. This was the most embarrassing one. Like I never thought I'd show a Maxwell Parish painting, but I was totally looking at these and I was like, it totally makes sense. I mean, you look, this is a picture of the piece that somebody sent me with this big cloud sitting on top of it and this is like a totally kitschy Maxwell Parish. I was thinking about Rocco. In the spring, the aspen trees that are planted across from it are reflected in it, so the whole thing looks very different and dappled and very painterly, quite frankly. And sometimes it's really intense, like at sunset when the sun is just, just by the horizon, the whole thing just like pops. This is a little animation that the architects had made when we first did it. So it gives you just a sense of the, the sculpture park and the layout. Um, the reason why I loved the site is because the trains run underneath it. So I felt like it was this floating plane that you walked across that was animated by the trains underneath, almost like one motion superimposed on another motion, like when you walk on an escalator. So you have the motion of you moving, moving walking, and then you have the motion of the trains rumbling underneath. And they pass by quite often, so it's a very real sort of sensation. This is a piece that I just did in um, Austin. It's called Stacked Waters. Um, the title refers to Donald Judd's stack pieces, um, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, and it, this was a very big atrium and very problematic kind of space. And what I did is I, I basically um, covered it all with this plastic that I had, this acrylic that I had cast for it um, for, for, for this piece. Um, so it's very much like a painting. It starts dark at the bottom, light at the top, and I had these colors made for me, so the progression is very specific, as though you were making a painting and changing colors as you went up. Um, and the way I dealt with the space is I basically thought of it as an empty volume that I was filling up with water. Uh, there were these really funky arches. There's this whole arcade around the outside of it, and. You know, I struggled with what to do with it, and then I just thought, when I, when I got to this part of the idea, I thought, great, I'll just incorporate it, and it'll just become like, like a cistern full of water, again, back to that cistern reference. Um, and there are skylights above this, so um, the, the, the acrylic is very reflective. And essentially, it marks like a kind of water line so as you move through the space and you go up these stairs, your, that water line changes in relation to your body moving out of the space. When you get to the top of these steps, you step out and it's almost like as you've stepped out of a pool or a volume of water. Another Judd piece. Okay, and this is the last thing I'm gonna talk about. This is the stuff that's here in the show. This is, a, this is the, the oldest surviving drawing made by Leonardo da Vinci. It's from 1437 and um, he made it when he was 21 years old. It's believed to be the first Western landscape drawing. Um, so we see the tradition of landscape in, 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 in China and in Japan and in, in, in other parts of the world. We, it's a long tradition. But in, in the West, it was always used as a background for something. 
Um, this is believed to be something that he painted sort of from his imagination because the facts don't match. Like what he's looking at doesn't look like what it's labeled as being. So he thought of it from his imagination. He made a kind of little sketch and then finished the rest from imagination. Um, and I was really interested in this idea of drawing the landscape. Uh, this is Barrowdale in the Lake District in Northern England. And it is the site where in the 1500s they discovered that there was an enormous, um, very pure form of graphite. This is before pencils. Pencils didn't exist. Graphite had not been discovered. Um, all of this land underneath consisted of a very high quality graphite, which actually they've never found a graphite of this quality any other place in the world. Um, and at the time, shepherds would use it to, this is like very rural uh, still, shepherds would use it to, to mark sheep. You know, it was just the stuff in the ground. And in the 1500s, they started mining it, and it became this very valuable material. Um, it was used to, to make um, cannons and different sort of warfare, but it was also used to make pencils. And so all of the great drawings that we see from all the old masters that start using graphite and pencils um, comes from here. It comes from Barrowdale. This is a really bad image of the of a mine. I won't get into the whole graphite thing, but this is the piece in the show called um, Drawn Waters, Barrowdale. And I wanted to make these sculptures that were in effect drawn. So this whole thing is made out of graphite. The top is made out of precision machined um, panels of graphite, and the bottom is graphite the way it looks when it's mined out of the earth. Um, and of course, it's a reference to a waterfall. I was looking at a lot of Leonardo da Vinci's studies of moving water. And my, my main, I mean, the main thing that I'm trying to do with these pieces is to make a sculpture that's really a drawing. And so by using graphite, I felt like I was uh, basically making a drawing. Um, um, the other thing that I'm really thinking about is this is uh, the Great Falls in Passaic, um, where Robert Smithson spent a lot of time. And I was um, thinking a lot of, of his uh, poor pieces and other, other works that he did in the land, which were essentially big drawings. And so I really tried to push the material to make it do things that didn't look at all like drawings, but were all made out of graphite, like this. And really, it's sort of a sculpture, it's sort of a drawing, it's sort of a painting. And this is epic. And I, had, I was looking at this image, which is a, 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 a historical print of a meteor shower, um, which happened in the early 1800s. And I was just fascinated by this image. So the, the piece essentially came from that. And uh, what I was doing is sort of thinking about, the, there's a little chunk of graphite on the wall, and then there's the drawing underneath it. And I was really thinking about, when you say drawing, you, you think of like drawing as like this finished object, and you also say drawing to think of the act of drawing. And there's no difference between the, the two in the way that you use the word, really. Um, so I wanted to make this huge piece that was basically uh, a, a drawing that encompassed both the act of drawing and the finished pro product of drawing. So uh, the solid form of the drawing, the solid piece of the graphite, and this, uh, the ephemeral mark that's made by this hand repeating um, the action over and over again. And I think that's it. I am happy to answer any questions if you have them. And if you don't, that's okay too. <laughs> Thank you.